All right. Everyone, thanks for uh, thanks for coming to our session. So, what I'm going to cover is basically what we end up doing on a, a weekly basis is uh, covering with startups, uh, you know, which development path is right for uh, the app or the web app, or you know, what selection is right for what they're trying to build. Um, so I'm Kirk Blue. I'm CEO of Touch Titans. We're an app agency downtown, and Don, you want to? Introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Don Archer. I'm a CTO of ACAexpress.com. We we do uh, insurance solutions around Obamacare, um, both for insurance agencies, agents, and consumers. Um, but my previous life, I spent 15 years at uh, Verizon. Uh, most recently, um, doing the, I was lead architect for the uh, FiOS mobile application. So I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Kirk kick it off and. Um, tell you mostly about what Touch Titans does, and then I have a few things to add at the end just to kind of tell you a little bit more about my experience in the mobile realm and uh, some of the decisions uh, that, that went into the choices that, that we made developing Files Mobile. Um, and then a lot of questions that I get asked by you know new startups about making mobile technology choices. So thanks for coming this morning. Move over here so I can see the slides. So as I mentioned, we're we're in downtown Dallas, so we work with a lot of big brands, but we also work with Dallas area startups. Um, so you know, uh, Red Bull, CNN, Nat Geo. We we've been around for ten years, and I get real excited about helping startups. There's a lot of innovative stuff going on in this town, so it's always interesting to hear what people are building. Here we go to the next one. So to start off with, I'm going to cover uh, client side, server side, as well as hosting options. Um, I'll even get into the whole parse debacle, which uh, affected a lot of the mobile app agencies uh, around Dallas and around Texas. All right. So this slide just is to kind of give a general overview of uh, phone gap versus, and when I say phone gap, I'm also looping in, there's other Cordova solutions. So there's Cincha Touch, there, there's Ionic, that's Angular based, but all of them is a middle layer are, are using uh, Apache Cordova. So, you know, and I would put Ionic as far as user experience at the top of that list. Um, and phone gap, really, for, for a basic app, if security, and there's some apps where security, is not as much a big deal. If, if you've got an RSS kind of app or a video app where worst case scenario, people get more access to your videos, it's not, not a big deal. So that's where PhoneGap might still be okay. You save costs. Um, but in general, there's been repeated issues, uh, at least from a development perspective, uh, on the security side. So I'll, I'll dig more into that. Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. Um, so as far as developer adoption, uh, PhoneGap has 5,000 developers. Xamarin is a little, a little counterintuitive because they're at 1 million developers, but only a, a small fraction of that is actually publishing apps. Because if you look at the, the total number for iPhone and Android developers, you know, it's 275,000 for iPhone around 400,000 for Android. So obviously, a very. And if you look in the market, there's very few uh, Xamarin shops publishing apps. So that's part of that selection. Xamarin, I feel, is a very solid platform. I love coding in C Sharp. It's a very great framework. The problem is, as a startup, if you're, if you're picking a technology company, you're, you're, um, you want something long term. So if things don't work out with the first shop that you build, the app with, you want a backup plan. So it's very easy to find an iPhone or Android developer. Finding a, a Xamarin shop that's actually publishing apps is going to be a difficult task. And, and I'm going to try to run through these really quick because we've only got, I think, 45 minutes. I want to leave time for Don and time for QA. But uh, why am I saying it's not secure? <laughs> OK. I love that image. All right. Um, you know, just going through the history, because, you know, even though as developers, a lot of us might already know this, uh, it's 
I guess, not common knowledge. So just especially on Android, you can easily launch intents through web apps. So it leaves a middle layer that's not secure. <clears throat> this happened a couple of years ago. Um, they weren't using PhoneGap, but they were using a, a hybrid web app uh, built on top of native solution. And uh, more recently, uh, IBM had two security uh, experts find uh, Cordova security issues, which led to the headline that you see at the bottom, where uh, they, <laughs> and imagine explaining that to a client, it, hey, yeah, we have to make your app no, no longer support the older frameworks because it's no longer secure. So it's a good reason to avoid that. <laughs> um, so Xamarin, there, there is a big network of uh, .NET developers. So I do see adoption, especially now that Microsoft has acquired Xamarin. I do see a lot of growth there. It's just at this point, there's not, you know, like I mentioned, there's not a lot of Xamarin uh, shops. But if you know how to code in C Sharp, or if you already have a .NET team, I would say that's a solid path. Um, also, performance and UX wise, is converting to native whenever you build an iPhone app or, a, or an Android app. So you're, you're getting native performance and user experience. It's not like PhoneGap where it's sitting on a tier above and it's having to use resources uh, to run the native app plus the web view. So server-side frameworks, um, I'm gonna address these two. I, I, I brought in Don, he's got a lot more experience on the Azure Microsoft side. Um, so just covering uh, Java versus Node.js, we're gonna go on to the next one. Oh, got a repeat slide there. <laughs> so PayPal is one of many large brands that have made the switch from, uh, from Java to Node.js. And in general, it just takes, a, it, you can get things done faster. Uh, their metric was 33% less code. They were able to do it with a smaller team um, and it can also handle more concurrent connections. So overall, uh, and, and I've seen that in practice where, you know, we might see a, a development team of 10 Java engineers. We can get essentially the same thing done with roughly half of that size of a Node.js team. So yeah, twice, you know, twice as fast with fewer people. So same thing I just mentioned, constructed with fewer files. Um, so, yeah, here's, here's a lot of the brands that are already adopting Node.js, a uh, very flexible framework too. So you can spin up a, a Node.js server very, very easily and quickly. And it's also important to mention here. Um, so we're one of many development shops that have, uh, you know, been affected by, uh, what happened with Parse and so Facebook acquired Parse, and they had over 600,000 developers on their platform. And you know, when they acquired it, obviously it was easy to get behind it. It's like, okay, Facebook's gonna make this part of their framework. Uh, it's built on top of Amazon Web Service, which is a solid back backend. Um, but uh, now we see the risk in that. They decide to, to cut that. Now all of us are porting it to Heroku or AWS and it requires um, building this from scratch. So there's alternatives like Firebase where it's a shortcut and yes, you can get things done cheaper and, and get, um, get to market faster and save that cost. But the downside of that is the same thing that happened with Parse could happen with a solution like that. If you build in Node.js or, or even Java, as an entrepreneur, if you, if you're, whatever you're comfortable coding in, I would say go that path. Because even if it's gonna take you longer in Java, if you understand the code behind your, your platform, that's really what matters. It, it enables you, um, even if it's at a basic level, to have a more intelligent conversation instead of just having it be some magic that's happening, you're paying your developers to do, to at least to have a high level understanding of what's going on. As far as server options, um, like 
you know, Red Bull's on Heroku, uh, love that framework. If you're porting from Parse to Heroku, we've actually got a video on our Touch Titan uh, channel of porting in five minutes. So I uh, invite you to use that. Uh, Firebase is kind of similar to Parse, except for it's a NoSQL uh, solution. It's really good, it's just like I mentioned. Uh, if you do a Node.js app, you can, you can put that anywhere. Uh, if Firebase shuts down, you're out of luck just like you were with Parse and you have to go port to something else. Um, and DigitalOcean, that's another really good one. All right, so I'm gonna leave time for Don to get up here. <laughs> If, if you or your engineers are already comfortable in Parse Server, they have ported a lot of the tools, um, just understand what's gonna be missing because there's some of that framework like the jobs and the, um, the cloud code uh, that isn't going to port. So um, that's where, you, you know, make sure they're comfortable with your roadmap of where you wanna go with that, okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, he said, what about using, so, so Parse has open sourced uh, the Parse framework to where you can deploy to your own Heroku server. Um, what do I think about using that? If you already have gone to the trouble to learn their framework and you're comfortable building in it, I, yes. It, you know, great platform, it's already got the APIs built, so fine with going that path. It's really hard because, I mean, this caught, like, what, 600,000 developers by surprise? So, yeah, it's, it's hard to foresee, but you can mitigate the risk by having a, like with Node.js, you know, okay, uh, DigitalOcean shuts down, you can deploy the same, it'll run the same on Heroku or AWS, so you can avoid that. I'll, I'll hand it over to Don so he can get through his slides. Hey. Um, I gave you a little introduction before, but uh, this shows you a little bit about me. I'm kind of a serial entrepreneur, started out with a paper route, and uh, you know, never really looked back from there. Um, had an app company for a little bit, a data center company. Uh, my wife and I started a lingerie startup and did that for a while. Um, and then I spent a, you know, a long stint at Verizon doing mobile apps. Um, most recently, I have Employee, which does applicant tracking, uh, Athlete360, which does athletic event registration, and I'm also the founder of the Google Developer Group of Dallas. Um, through all that, uh, you know, th there was a lot of mobile technology. Um, literally every startup I've had is kind of somewhat related to or, or needed mobile technology. And it, it's just been an interesting ride. So I, I've got to take a little survey. How many people out there are developers? Okay, you guys are actually coding, great. How many people out there are, have a startup and you're trying to find developers? Okay, right, so that covers the whole audience, right? You're either, you're either a developer, you're trying to find a developer, you're trying to select a, a mobile platform, right? So when you're doing this, you either, you either know the code yourself or you're trying to find a developer that, that's gonna develop the app for you. In either case, you're already familiar with some technology. And I think the, you know, one of the big questions I get asked is, should I go Android or iOS? Well, the distribution in the US is about 50-50. You have to do both, right? Um, with the exclusion of a couple of special cases. If you're building like a kiosk or something where you, you know, you're gonna set it up in a mall, hey, I'd recommend go Android, it's cheaper, right? Your hardware's gonna be cheaper, your implementation's gonna be cheaper, it's just easier to, easier to deploy. If you're looking to sell a product and you don't have the development resources to, to do both, or you've got somebody that's you know intensely familiar with iOS, just do iOS. If you're selling something, if you're gonna if you're gonna monetize it via the App Store, iOS is a more expensive device. The people have more money. It's gonna sell more on the App Store, right? So, in general, the answer to that 95% of the time is you have to do both. You need to launch on both. If you can, you need to launch simultaneously on both. Um, because your traction is going to be better, your marketing is going to be easier, right? If you're telling somebody, hey, go get the app, they're like, oh, but it's not on iPhone, it's just on Android. You don't want that kind of situation, right? So try to do a simultaneous release on both platforms. Um, 
that's a Protestant and a Catholic. And if you still don't get the joke, then I, I can't help. Next slide. Um, so Kirk talked a lot about this. Um, basically, you have a bunch of options, right? Uh, how many people are familiar with Xamarin? Okay. Xamarin's, Xamarin's uh, like Kirk mentioned, it's a great cross-compiling platform. So you write in C Sharp, uh, and then it compiles into the native app. So when you take a Xamarin app, you, you write it in, in C Sharp, and then you hit go, and it actually turns it into Android code or turns it into iOS code, right? So that's one level of kind of simplification you can do to make your job easier rather than writing um, an iOS app in Swift and then you know, going and writing a, a full Android app in Java. That's a lot of work, right? You can write your app in Xamarin, cross-compile it, and deploy it to both platforms. Um, so the, the middle one there with the little phones, that's PhoneGap. So PhoneGap's a wrapper application for HTML. How many people are familiar with PhoneGap? OK. Basically, with a PhoneGap application, you write something in HTML, and then you wrap it up as an application and deploy it to the app stores. So PhoneGap makes it incredibly simple to deploy an application. However, as Kirk pointed out, there's security issues, and there's also usability issues. As you look at this scale, you know, it, the final option is you can just make a mobile website. You can do it in HTML5, right? And then it's easily deployed to pla all platforms. Everybody can use it. But at that point, you're missing the advantage of people discovering you in the App Store. So you have to consider that. If you're not interested in people discovering you through that channel, or that's not a dependency of your business model, then just write an HTML application, right? You can direct people there. Um, you'll get your stuff done. But it also depends on user experience. As you go down this scale, you go from writing Android or iOS applications in the native environment to something like Xamarin, which cross-compiles, to something like PhoneGap, which wraps up an HTML application all the way to HTML, you, you go down in complexity, right? But you also go down in user experience. So if you need an intense user experience with a really usable interface and it's, it, it's, it's central to your business model, you have to write native applications. There's no other option. So a lot of people ask me if the you know do I need to build it myself or should I find a team should I offshore it should I go to Touch Titans and just you know write a check to Kirk and have him take care of it? Well, the question is, do you code? I mean, do you know somebody who codes? Can you set up your business model around people who can write the application for you? If you can and you have the time, then you're going to get exactly what you need out of it, right? If your business model is such that you're trying to get a business going and you need a mobile application, you should probably look at a shop like Kirk's where you can just get it done and go to market. I mean, we're all about you know, the startup culture, but the, 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 real, I mean, the real point is getting to market, get it in front of users. Most often when you design something, you're going to have an initial design for your application. As soon as you throw it in front of users, all that's going to change, right? They're going to tell you how it really needs to work, what it really needs to do. So the, the biggest recommendation I have there is get it in front of users as quickly as you can. Um, if you don't understand minimum viable product, go Google minimum viable product and make that. You have to make the bare minimum application that offers some useful functionality to your users and get it in front of them. And you have to do it as quickly as possible. Because your business is going to change. Your business is going to move around. So if you need to buy it, get the investment. Buy the application, get it to market. If you can build it quickly and you you understand what that minimum viable product is, and you have, you know, lots of spare time, <laughs> build it yourself. Um, this is a little bit about the stack we use at ACI Express. As I mentioned, we do uh, insurance applications for issuers, agents, and consumers. So we have consumer-facing uh, apps in the App Store. Um, we also have you know, uh, web software applications that issuers use. Um, when people think about their stack, they're like, oh, well, am I going to go, you know, what am I going to do on the server side? Am I going to go with Node? What kind of database am I going to use? Um, all that sort of stuff. But I encourage you to think of your whole stack. And by your entire stack, I mean, what are you going to use for source code control? What are you going to use for trouble tickets? Um, what are you going to use for analytics after you release the application? Think of the entire path, right? And sometimes those, those kind of things can weigh into your decisions. Maybe not in your core decision on 
you know, whether to whether to do a native application in Java or, or to do an application in Xamarin, but they are going to impact your business considerably, especially analytics. You have to put analytics in your application at launch because if you can't see what's happening, you don't know where to drive your business. You've muddied up the windshield and you're still driving at 70 miles an hour down the highway, which is crazy. Um, so for our stack, we use Git, Jira, and Bitbucket. If you're not using Git for source code control, <laughs> use Git. Just use Git. Um, SVN, TFS, that's all nonsense. Just use Git. Everybody uses Git. Use Git. Um, Jira, we use Jira and Bitbucket just because uh, we have a lot of private repositories. There's not a lot of open source that that we do, we have um, API connections to CMS, the Center for Medicaid Services, so that gets a little touchy and we keep most of that private. Um, GitHub is a great repository. Um, both of them offer free ticketing. Uh, so you can, you know, Bitbucket and GitHub both offer free issue tracking, so you can just kind of bolt it on to what, what you have. Um, so that makes it easy. Um, I come from a Microsoft shop at Verizon. And so that's what I knew. So when we built our new startup, I took the Microsoft tools and built it with that. We use SQL Server, we use uh, Microsoft ASP MVC, Visual Studio, and we deploy it all to Azure. Um, even though that sounds like a corporate solution and a solution like, you know, you might only choose if you've got deep pockets and you don't care about your Azure bill, it's actually pretty cheap to do on a shoestring for a startup. So. Again, I would say if that's what you know, don't let anybody talk you into, you know, trying to convert your shop or trying to learn something new. Just get to market. Um, take what you know, take the people you know, use that technology and get it to market. Um, I have to plug Firebase and Polymer a little bit. I mean, I, I, if you haven't used Firebase, it's worth a look. It's really, really fast. Um, there are some concerns with it. Uh, Google's behind it now. I hope they don't shut it down immediately. If, if you, again, the whole point's getting to market. If you need to do something quick, Firebase is kind of a cool tool. Um, if you know Node.js, you can build it yourself, right? You can, you can go in and create your own thing. And then, as Kirk said, you have independence from these volatility issues in the market. Um, but if you know if you if you don't have the experience, you need to get something up quick. Take a look at Firebase and Polymer. Um, Polymer is also uh, Polymer is Google's uh, web component language. Uh, it's not the only one. Mozilla has a web component tool set as well. Um, but if you're doing web applications or you have a web adjunct product to your mobile product, um, web components are the future of all web development. Either take a look at Polymer or take a look at um, Mozilla's. Uh, web component language, it's great. Um, we use native Android, native iOS, and then we use Google Analytics and the Elk stack, which is Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Um, for, if, if you need custom metrics that aren't covered by Google Analytics, take a look at Elk. It's a little tricky to install, um, but once you get it up and running, it'll handle massive amounts of data with awesome real-time reporting. Do you guys use Elk at all, Kurt? Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic, right? You can you can turn it into anything you want. Um, whatever you do with your stack is up to you. Uh, just don't use Cold Fusion. That's all I have to say. So again, the main point of this slide is just make sure that you find the easiest, shortest path to market. Right? That's what you need to do. If you take, you know, five hundred thousand in seed round funding and fool around trying to find your development team, that's a mess. You need to just figure out the fastest path you can to get to market. If you have Series A and you have to convert your whole application from you know, Microsoft over to Node.js or whatever, that's kind of typical. If you look at the, you know, the roadmap of any of these large applications, they typically started out on some other platform completely and they converted over at some point, right? But the whole point is getting to market and getting your product in front of users. So that's it for me. Thank you, guys. Um, I think we're just going to do Q&A because we want to leave a lot of time to find out what you're doing, find out about your projects. I'll leave that one for Kirk. So the question was on the, on the scale of user experience and everything, where does Ionic fit?
So uh, Ionic, as far as user experience, is great. Also on the development side with it being Angular-based, um, I, I love that aspect of it. But um, if you're, <laughs> like I, I wouldn't build a bank app on it because it's, it's prone to those same kind of security flaws. If you know, already know Angular, yes. If not, um, then like a phone gap would be a quicker path. Yep. Yes. Uh, well, and generally, like when we hire out of colleges, like when we hire out of uh, UTD or UNT, they primarily are just learning Java <laughs> in college. Um, so there's a ton of Java developers in Dallas. Um, there's a good proponent of, uh, of .NET. There's a ton of .NET guys, but most of them are doing enterprise. Um, and, and most of them lo love that world. It's, it's lucrative. So. Um, yeah, it's definitely a, a mix depending depending on what you're looking for. Um, Dallas ha has quite a uh, talent pool. Yeah. yeah, I would say. I mean, I hired my guys off Craigslist. Um, they just got a couple of them had gone through ITT, and I didn't have money to you know to spend on high end developers. So I hired some people, low salaries and everything, and then I spent six weeks getting them ramped up. But they were .NET developers, um, and they were fairly well trained. The local colleges like um, uh, North Lake and uh, they, they, they all have certification programs. So you can literally go over and talk to an instructor at North Lake and say, hey, I have positions available. You know, is there some way we can work together to, you know, interview your new, your new graduates or whatever the case might be? Um, the other thing is you have to look at Meetup. If you go on to Meetup and you look at, uh, there, there's the .NET users group of North Dallas. Um, there's the Android developer group as well. If you're trying to find developers, that's the best thing I can recommend. Just find a meetup and, and see how many, what the attendance is. And you know, if you go and there's like two guys there, that gives you a pretty good indication that the local pool for that technology is pretty dry. Also, I'll put in a plug for uh, HackDFW. He mentioned we're, we're sponsoring that this weekend. So if you're looking for developers, there's going to be a lot of developers there. <laughs> yeah. oh, sorry. Yeah. Well. I can talk to you more about this uh, afterwards. What's that? Yeah, um, so the question was about Verizon specifically. You guys are seeing them all in the news. It's kind of a train wreck. Um, so I can talk to you more about this afterwards specifically. Um, basically, they're selling off uh, the Fios uh, fiber section of the West Coast um, just because the hard lines themselves aren't that profitable. But we'll talk about it after the. I, I can talk about that for hours. Let me let me get with you afterwards, though. I'll tell you more about more about the files sure. history. Yeah. I would definitely go the contract route and try them out. Before, you know, I, I would definitely do that. I I. I'd say that's pretty good as well. Typically, it's a little bit more expensive. Contract contract developers are a little bit more expensive. Um, our startup, we hired a couple of people on contract to get things rolling. And then I brought on some students just to get them ramped up and get them familiar with the business. Because in the long run, it's cheaper um, to, to bring them on salary and get somebody who's green and build them up. 
Well, and also I want to add to that, whenever we brought in, like, if we bring in a team of 10, there's usually a bottom 20% that, we, that you know, uh, look good on paper. Like, we, we've had guys that, oh, I've got two years at Samsung or whatever. Well, when they come in and um, just the work ethics there or, or, you know, whatever. So just consider that when you bring them on. Oh, yeah, no, just for uh, VR hacking. <laughs> I'm sure we have at some point. Uh, so the first question was um, any experience with Unreal. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a gaming engine that um, enables you to pretty quickly put together a game with object models, surfaces, all that sort of stuff. You can put together both 2D and 3D games. Um, have a little bit of experience with it, um, just in gamification at, at Verizon. Uh, we never released anything, but there were some prototypes that we developed. It's interesting because you can code in C Sharp. Uh, so that that's another kind of talent pool you can tap into. Um, you get these guys coming out of ITT with the gaming uh, certifications, and they're looking for game jobs. And as you know, like game jobs are the top of the top, right? The game companies don't hire anybody unless they're killer. So it's hard to get, come out of ITT and flop into a game job. Um, it's kind of easy to pick those guys up and say, hey, you know C Sharp, come over and do my Xamarin app or whatever the case might be. What was the second second part of it? That's right. Yeah, um, so on Java for Verizon, we just we did a little bit of native development for video applications just because we need high performance. Um, processing to be able to do things like signaling during a video stream. Um, but we would develop that as a library uh, and then roll it into the application. Most of the applications written in Java because it's faster. Same thing on iOS, you do, you know, if you have to, you can do um, a, a library in Objective C or whatever the, you know, the library guys are familiar with and then roll it into Swift because it's, it's faster to code. Yeah, so there's mean stack and there's lamp stack, which I, both are awesome. And um, there's modifications to that. So instead of using Angular, you might use Ember or React or whatever. Um, but just in general, I, you know, look at those stacks and you're going to get different levels of support. If it's a new like twist on the mean stack, just realize going if you're building a big project, there's going to be uh, less support and less people are going to run into the hurdles that you will on, on that stack. Right. Yeah, and I think your question was, is there any documentation of the best stack, right? Like who, who's releasing the best stack? And the, 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 I think the answer to that is it's different for everybody. It depends on your situation, the developers you can connect to, the developers you can find in Dallas. I mean, it's, what, what might make a genius stack here because you have access to the talent would not be the same in San Francisco. We have so many stacks because there are major corporations using them all. Um, you can literally go from you know Amazon to PayPal to Verizon to um, you know they're major companies. They're 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 running them all, and so when you talk about a proven stack, to some degree they're all proven. Mm -hmm. um, you 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 literally just have to take what works for you and build on that. I I know there's a lot of. <sighs> There's a lot of desire there to, you know, okay, so I have a lot of choices and I can, you know, I can pick anything I want. I want to pick the best one. It, it's all about people and what works for you in your situation. It, it's also important to consider, uh, like, LAMP stack is open source and mean stack is open source. Uh, Win stack is very solid, very good, but it, it's very popular on the enterprise side. Uh, but there is, there is generally more cost to uh, the Microsoft side server development. 
So that's another, but it's still solid, you know, so. Do you say Chinese robots? What does he say? I can't hear him. So, like, botnet, like? Oh, AI, okay. Oh, yeah. um, well, it, it's definitely come a long way. Have you seen x.ai, where it's like a scheduling, uh, automatic scheduling app? So it, it's an emerging market still. Um, you know, I, I thought x.ai was really solid, and then uh, Blake Burris, who's another guy who's been in the scene a long time, he's like, well, he figured out a way to break it. So. Um, yeah, it's still it's still an early stage thing, but can do some really cool stuff at this point. Yeah, I think you have to look at what you're doing and see if it makes sense for you. But also, Microsoft and Google have released um, cloud computing intelligence platforms where you can literally take your script, your code, your design, and load it onto their neural networks for processing. So the the fact that it's um, useful enough that they're offering those as cloud services should be an indication that it's dawning, right? It's nearly a ubiquitous technology that's just going to be bled into various applications. So uh, it, rather than it being some kind of groundbreaking thing like x.ai, I think you're going to use a lot of applications that just have it under the hood and you don't even realize it's there. So glad that wasn't a question on Chinese robots. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So uh, I would definitely check out Polymer that, that Don mentioned. Um, Don, uh, Don, what was the other one you mentioned? Vue? Uh, VUE. VU, VUE. Um, Angular, I, you know, I love as a framework, but it does come with its uh, headaches and nuances. So um, React, I, you know, I haven't had a chance to dive into that one yet. So I'm, I'm very very strong on the new web component systems because they provide you the isolation. So when you start when you start building your application, Angular works out great. You get a routing controller, you throw some stuff into it, you're building your web application, everything's going nice. As your application gets increasingly complex, it's harder and harder to maintain because Angular doesn't have clean separation of responsibilities um, at that level. And if you look at the web component languages, um, both Mozilla's and Google's Polymer, they have a very clean separation so that you can accomplish small tasks, isolate them in a web component, and then build on top of that. So it becomes really easy to manage much, much larger applications with Polymer and, and Mozilla. That's an opinion, but whatever. Hoorah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Windows 10? Well, I would look at your market. Like, uh, there's some schools, like, up, up north in the New York area that they're, they're all on Windows 10. So, I mean, it depends on what you're building. And if the target market is there, then, then yes, it's a great idea. Um, that's actually something we were talking about earlier is for, for a lot of brands that come for us and are like, hey, should we do iOS or Android? Look, if you look at your analytics, you can see okay, 60% of my audience is on Android or, you know, the other way around. So uh, if, any metrics and analytics you can get on your target demographic will tell you which path you should take. Yeah, again, a lot of people choose technologies just for technology's sake. I mean, they're like, oh, this is cool. We should build an app with this new thing, right? In the end, you're trying to get to market, get, get your stuff in front of people, find out where the people are and build what they need. Yeah, so um, Google Analytics is a good example, right? You can launch your web, your your Android or your iOS application, but if you don't put the Google Analytics library in it, you get really rudimentary 
metrics from the app stores. Um, basically, it tells you how many installs you've got, maybe some demographics. Android's gotten a, a lot better within the past couple years about telling you the demographics of your users. But if you put the Google Analytics library in there with a couple of lines of code, you get far richer demographics, right? So my point there was make sure that you have analytics in the application at launch. It's not expensive. Um, Google Analytics is free. And it's not expensive in terms of time or code. Um, it's literally just throw the library into the application. But don't put an application in the market without analytics. You want the additional data on your users. No. I mean, if you're using a solid framework. Uh, Localytics is another good one uh, in addition to, to Google. Um, also on the entertainment apps we've done, like with CNN, uh, analytics can be used to tell you what your users are interested in. So when they have trending topics, they can help filter that based on analytics. So you can see which, what users are clicking on, and it becomes a hot spot, and move that to the top. Um, so it's a, and also, if there's segments or categories, uh, like in Red Bull, that are not popular, we can segment that out. So it's good. That's mostly data on when things are working. You also mentioned when things are crashing, right? So Android, um, the App Store itself um, shows you crash metrics, tells you what your main exceptions were in the application, um, provides a count of them. iOS doesn't, uh, as far as I know, doesn't have the, any of the same functionality, but there are libraries that you can build into the applications to give you crash tracking. Yeah, so uh, there's crash analytics now, so you can crash. Um, Jira, Jira Mobile Connect also does that. If you're using Jira uh, from Atlassian for ticketing, um, they have Jira Mobile Connect. And so anytime an application crashes and a user sends feedback, it'll automatically create a ticket and then cluster those and count um, how many crashes you've had on a particular ticket, which is routed right to your developers, integrated to Git. And then when they commit code, they just put pound 570 closed. It actually connects back to the user and tells them the issue was fixed, and there's a whole life cycle there for crash management. I love Python. Yeah. Yes. It, well, it's a simple framework that you can do a tremendous amount with. So yeah, if you're building in Python, it's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it, it's a framework that's been around a long time, like, like Java. Um, it's really flexible, open source. Um, uh, you see it a lot in hardware hacking. Uh, it's, it's also used for server-side development. Um, for someone with a lot of experience with Python on server, I would talk to Dan Hess, Don Hess back there. So, I, I think it's kind of funny, um, Kirk's response to that, because he's like, yeah, I use Python. I think Kirk would probably say that with about any technology you could come up with. And what that goes to show you is that eventually you're, you're going to touch them all. So be curious um, and always kind of do your research on them. Um, if, you, if you're a developer, man, download them and play with them. And it's not that hard to get into new frameworks and new stuff. Um, that's the only way you're really going to be able to pick out what's right for you. Maybe something has a distinct advantage that's unique to your product and your market that, you know, us sitting up here talking about general, general terms and general, uh, general things wouldn't, wouldn't recognize. But if, if it makes sense for your product and your market, then it's something to dive into. Any other questions? Yep. Story? Uh, the question, sorry, we're really bad about repeating the questions. The question was, um, can we talk a little bit more about database selection and data storage on the back end? Yeah, so there's the, the traditional, like the MySQL route, where it's um, relational tables and whatnot. Uh, the new trend towards uh, NoSQL, the advantage with that is it's more of live data. So uh, the, on the user side, they're seeing a live instance. If data changes, it changes in real time. Uh, across across devices looking at that. Um, we're a big fan of uh, Postgres, but that's just what we like to work with. Um, so like Don said, I mean, definitely look at and play with which one, you know. Yeah, um, as far as our technology goes, we use primarily uh, SQL Server because um, we're dealing with large, large quantities of data. 
uh, and the real-time aspect of it is not that important to my particular application. Um, but we do use a hybrid. So, uh, for example, someone, uh, a, an insurance agent is signing someone up for insurance. We have to call some APIs, which are um, kind of an asynchronous process through CMS. So it can take 20 seconds. Uh, sometimes it can take two and a half minutes. In order to give the agent some impression of what's going on, in addition to my SQL Server, I take all the all the um, insurees records in, right? They're looking at the insurees record, goes into SQL Server, I make my API call, and then I have a, a little agent that's working with CMS waiting for a response. And as it's getting pieces of the response, it updates Firebase. Um, Firebase gives me a real-time WebSocket connection um, back down to the web page so that the agent has a little progress bar and he can see um, as he's signing someone up, you know, what the steps are that CMS is, is going through taking this long process. So what we've done is we've wrapped up, you know, it, it, everything's stored in our relational database and that's where all of our infrastructure goes. But for signaling, we're using Firebase just to get the signals back to the web page. So that's, that's a good example of, you know, just selecting technologies that are right for your business. Um, we literally split an application in half. We use two different databases. So the question is um, about UI design, and do we recommend any design tools um, specifically for U UI design to hopefully avoid hiring a high-end designer? Yeah. Um, well, you you can lay out uh, kind of a, a basic blueprint kind of thing using like Envision. Uh, that's a good prototyping tool. Um, and and for design, for uh, Sketch has become really popular. It's great. So. Um, Photoshop has a little bit of a learning curve for new users, but Sketch is great. You can hand that to a developer, and they can grab you know, the colors you want and everything. So you could use that for an initial layout. Um, also, that's important for startups. Uh, if you just need a clickable prototype, you can do that just with the design screenshots in Envision and just interlink the, uh, the screens. We're kind of old school. We do it on paper. Um, we literally do the paper prototyping process. So I mean, don't let. You know, don't let high-end design really impede you. Um, if you go out and you look at the human interface guidelines for iOS or the material design guidelines for Android, you already know what your buttons need to look like. There's no, there's no decision to be made on, you know, what the shape of a button is. That's already decided for you. If you're making an application that's for one of those platforms, I strongly encourage you to make it look like the other applications on that platform. If somebody opens your application and it's all cool with drop shadows and flashy stuff, it doesn't look like the rest of the applications on their phone. They're not going to immediately um, gravitate towards it, and they're not going to get that, that connection to your app right away. So I, I would think in that way, a lot of those very pixel-specific design decisions are already made for you. And something like the paper prototyping process can get you through uh, just interaction design. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you guys so much for uh, coming out to listen to us this morning. We'll be around for uh, questions if you have anything else you want to ask us personally. Cool. Thank you.